great to be here first and foremost. Uh, I know this is uh, probably my first time uh, speaking to this, this group. Uh, I'm Ash Pilkarni. Uh, I recently uh, took the, the role of CEO of Elastic, but not new to the company now. It's been about a year. So it's been a year. I joined almost a year ago, a little more than a year ago, as uh, the chief product officer. And uh, it's been a wonderful, fun ride working with Shai, working with uh, the engineering teams, working with all of the other teams, and now really excited to be in this role. I think there's a, there's a lot for us to be excited about. You know, it's a, I started my career as a developer, uh, and you know, it's, I, I, when I look at Elasticsearch and I look at the capability and flexibility and the teams that work on it and the community that, you know, sort of promotes and, and pushes us to innovate more, like I, I get excited every day. Like I, to me, like the, the most interesting thing that I can see on the horizon is the 8.x transition. Um, you know, 8.0 is, is uh, uh, very close um, and it's going to come with Lucene 9 and there is so much amazing stuff that's coming with Lucene 9. I'm personally very excited about it. So a yeah, lot to do in terms of evolving the platform, but then also personally what gets me most excited is the journey to the cloud. Um, you know, I see everything that we build at Elastic, the best way to experience it is on Elastic Cloud. You know, the ease with which developers can get started in building their applications on top of Elastic, on Elastic Cloud, I think it's just, an, it's just a different, much more compelling experience. And that's, that's what you know, gets me really, really excited. Over the past you know, year, we innovated significantly with searchable snapshots. So the ability to go and search object storage, uh, S3, Google Cloud Storage, or others, anything with like S3 compatible API, or we have native support for Azure and Google Cloud as well. And, and like that suddenly opened up the whole prism of being able to store massive amounts of data and then being able to still search them. Now, the funny thing is because we can index everything, searching on S3 suddenly becomes fast because you don't have to go and download, you know, petabytes of data to, go, to try to go and stream it. You can pick and choose with like almost like laser precision into S3 and figure out how you want to search it. So even when we go and search on, on S3, we're extremely fast, which is very, very exciting to me. Um, but then the question is, how do we bring that level of flexibility across everything that we do? So it's no longer just like just in one tier, in our frozen tier. How do we bring that level of experience as a first class citizen taking S3 and S3 like blob storage as a first class citizen in Elasticsearch and exposing it to our users and thinking about it maybe slightly differently um, thinking about query languages, obviously as you do queries and some of the queries might go and hit S3 and they might go local and how do we create a, a query language that can take all of these semantics and make sure that they're, uh, they're successful and exposed in the best way to the, uh, to the user. Like those things I get excited about and everything that we build on top of it, like the ability to explore data easily in Kibana is derived from that. Uh, our advancements in the various solutions that we do that I'm sure we get to. Uh, so, you know, there's tons of work uh, left to be done. And I'm, I'm personally very, very excited to get back to my CTO orbital. I'm, I'm having fun and, and getting excited about talking about all of these things. You know, and, and, and very, you know, uh, you know, spend much more time doing that, basically. You know, I, I think the, the biggest advantage that you get when you move to the cloud is everything becomes that much more frictionless. And it's, uh, there is, sometimes I, I feel that people ask this question, well, do you want flexibility or do you want simplicity? And to me, that's a false choice. You know, it's, there's, there's no reason why you shouldn't aspire to have both. Uh, and the platform is designed to be extremely flexible, as, as we all know, like anybody who's used Elasticsearch and Kibana and everything around it knows that the platform is very well vertically integrated very flexible and scalable, but the simplicity that comes from being able to onboard data very easily, not having to worry about um, you know, or scaling with capabilities like auto scaling, and we've done a lot in auto scaling and it'll only keep getting better, um, in the ability to you know, through fleet um, deploy agents and, and pull in all the data that you want from that agent and fleet architecture. As we, as we go forward, 
you know, we are investing in how do we bring in cloud native data more easily into the platform, minimizing the amount of work that you need to do on the configuration side. In the cloud, monitoring can take on you know, a, a different flavor where you can monitor more easily, you can be more proactive in notifying the users when there are issues with their clusters and so on. I think there's a, there's a lot that we are focused on just in terms of simplifying the work of the developer, making it easy for them to focus on what they're really trying to do. You know, ideally, you want to take away the management, monitoring, infrastructure aspects of what you know, they would otherwise have to worry about and just get them to focus on building their applications on Elasticsearch and using Kibana for visualization and using Agent and Fleet for bringing in data. And let us worry about all the, the infrastructure pieces. That to me is what gets me really excited about cloud. And then in the cloud, it's so much easier to get a user to start the journey in one place and then have the breadcrumbs to make it easier for them to use the capabilities in more and more interesting ways. You know, you're pulling in data from your web logs or from CloudTrail. You might be using it for observability. What do you want to be able to look into it to see if there are any you know, security issues that we might be uncovering? Making that easier is just so much more seamless in the cloud than it is um, if you're, if you're self-managing everything. And that's why I get so passionate about cloud. It's just fundamentally more frictionless and it allows the developers to just focus on what they care most about, their application. The other aspects of investing in cloud is our ability to really hone our innovation. Uh, you know, I mentioned Searchable Snapshot, for example. Searchable Snapshot exists only because we assume that we have around us blob storage, like S3, like Google Cloud or something like that. And then that means that suddenly we can deliver features that would have been extremely hard to go and develop and deliver if it was only going to a self-managed solution, if that makes sense. And I think there's a lot of opportunity in that area. Like, how do we double down on innovation that we can deliver much faster and at a different scale if we focus on cloud? Um, I think I mentioned the ability to go and, um, and even double down even more on this like notion of treating systems like S3 as first-class storage mm -hmm. systems, um, query engine that is much more flexible and can support all the various ways that our users today query while still retaining how fast Elastic is and how fast Elasticsearch and Lucene are, uh, that I think will help inform uh, even, even better improved user experiences in areas like Kibana, the ability to define alerting on data, the ability to define custom visualizations on top of it. Um, and I think the, the other part is that there, as, as we go and we start to connect to more and more systems, we need to do a lot of things, right? It's like we need to go and, Ash mentioned, uh, I don't know, get data from CloudTrail, uh, monitor cloud information and try to analyze it for security uh, use cases or observability, uh, being able to go and apply uh, OPA rules, for example, uh, OPA is a Cloud Native Foundation project, and being able to use that on top of your data that you have. So it's another processing unit that you would want to go and use. And like, there's more and more and more things that we want to go and provide as features and we try to make them as seamless as possible. Uh, but at the same time, like there's more work that needs to be done and that's much more easily exposed in cloud because we can hide away, hide away a lot of this complexity. Yeah, I'll, you know, I'll just add one thing to that because I, I could not be more excited about everything that Shai is talking about, right? Fundamentally, I think the cloud gives us a much better platform to innovate fast. I mean, this is the one thing that we always have been known for. This is something that I hear from every customer that I ever go and talk to and visit. They always love the pace of innovation that they see from Elastic. Like I, the number of times I hear, wow, it's amazing that you brought that feature out in two months, or you did that in the last four months, like your product has evolved so much. I constantly keep hearing it. So it's, it's something that we are known for. It's something that we should be extremely, extremely proud of. Having this cloud focus allows us to go even faster in my mind. And I think that's what excites me about what Shai said. To me, the other aspect of this, which is the simplicity and how do we improve the overall developer experience is the other part of this that, that 
just makes this such a powerful story. Because if you can have really innovative new capabilities that nobody else can deliver, and we can do it in a way that makes it simple for the developer to get started and get going and continue to use more of, that is such a powerful combination. It just simplifies a developer's life. And you know, I just, I just think about what, what did we have when I was doing development and I had to use databases and like the, the technologies that were available then and what is available now, like just the integration of the entire stack in Elastic Cloud is so seamless, it's so beautiful, and we can make it even better. Like that's the part that just gets me very, very excited. First of all, 8.0 comes with Luc9, and I think typically if you, if you look at our history, we tended to treat, to really innovate at the .x releases, and then make sure that we focus on the, on the major releases as a, an easy path to upgrade to, and focus on a new major version of Lucene, and then create the right foundations that allows us to innovate extremely fast in dot one, dot two, dot three, dot four. And that's what you expect to see in the major version. So maybe I'll focus for a bit about Lucene 9. Probably the favorite feature that I have in Lucene 9 is the Yiddish stammer uh, that was released, uh, obviously with my background. And not that I know Yiddish, but I heard that it's popular among my kind. Um, and, uh, but joking aside, obviously the stammer capabilities, you know, the continuous investments in amazing community, uh, including by people that speak Yiddish in terms of making sure that we support languages better and better and better. And I, I think Lucene is a, you know, if you just look at the analyzer, language analyzer that it has, it just shows the diversity of, of, you know, the geo diversity of the community that is exposed through it. Um, uh, other things that I like about Lucene 9, uh, it, uh, small things, sorry for getting geeky for a second, but it's like moving from 4 to P4 compression on posting lists, like that ended up having really big effect on, on the ability to store more efficiently data. You know, I think Adrian, Adrian did a test that message fields in logs suddenly becomes 15% smaller, for example. So, you know, I love the you know, just a better compression algorithm and then suddenly it makes a big impact to our users. Um, the vector search work that the team is doing, you know, we've been, the whole Lucene community is investing in vector search. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a wonderful, you know, evolution of Lucene as, a, as an information retrieval library. Um, and obviously we make a lot of investments together with the rest of the community from Elastic perspective, like, you know, with developers and people that contribute to it. I think we're just getting started there. Uh, and the thing that I get excited about the what we're trying to do with vector search is that we're trying to uh, combine together vector search with the flexibility of filtering and aggregation that comes with Apache Lucene, and and that's really tough to do. You know, if you look at vector search in terms of usage, it's really hard to have you know the multi-dimensionality that Lucene today provide about data. You know, it's like you have a thousand attributes. Go ahead and into index them. You know, like the thing that I still say about Lucene and Apache Lucene and Elasticsearch, by default, we index everything. Like it's pretty mind blowing. You know, when you tell, tell that to a, like a relational database engineer, they go like, are you nuts? Like, did you just define a, a table with a thousand columns and you index everything? Uh, but that's what we can do in, in, in Apache Lucene and Elasticsearch, which means that you can have really so much flexibility around how you want to slice and dice your data and look at it in different dimensions. And if we can combine as much of that flexibility together with vector search, uh, that's going to be amazing. I think that will be able, we'll be able to bring vector search and all the related algorithms that are built on top of it to a much wider audience instead of like the big Googles and, and you know, big companies that are have enough capacity to go and build models and sustain them and things like that. And then you have more flexibility to look at the data uh, and bring it to more people. The same way that we brought that flexibility of just regular data, if that makes sense, uh, to, to our users. Now, I get excited about it. It's a really tough technical problem, but you know, the team that is working on it are much smaller than me and they're, they're doing an amazing job in doing that. So that, that's another area that I'm really excited about. Tons of uh, other improvements, I think, you know, Apache Lucene is an amazing, amazing open source project that just 
you know, the collaboration there is just humbling to see. We've been a huge part of it from Elasticsearch perspective and or Elastic, the company perspective for the past 10 years, even before. And obviously we plan to continue to do that moving forward. Um, so yeah, I spoke a lot about, you know, Apache Lucene, but as usual, as I said, it's like that tends to be like the biggest improvement, the biggest major, major version, if that makes sense. I will say one thing you ask about uh, things that we're working on, and I think that that's important. Together with new versions of Apache Lucene, what we ended up seeing is that we stopped supporting, because Apache Lucene stopped supporting older versions in terms of being able to read that. And as we start to see users store more data in Elasticsearch, petabytes of data, and wanting to store them for a much longer period of time, uh, we're actually working on ability to read older versions of Apache Lucene so we can allow our users to go in and search across much longer periods of time, if that makes sense, or older data that they, uh, that they had in Elastic. That's something that I'm super excited about because then it means that upgrades becomes cheaper, like much easier to do because you don't necessarily lose the ability to search on older data as a result of it. Yeah, I'll, I'll maybe uh, just add a couple and reinforce a couple that Shai just said. Like personally to me, the whole vector search area when it comes to the work that's going on in the Lucene community, the work that Elasticsearch team engineers are doing in that area, that to me is very exciting. I can see how that's going to have a big impact on everything around our enterprise search use cases. Um, the other one is, you know, there's a, there's a cute title that we use called Make It Minor for this last thing that Shai talked about, which is how do we allow our users to actually be able to read and work with data that's been created in, in older versions because fundamentally to me, that's, that's gonna have the big impact of allowing our customers and our users to continue upgrading more naturally, more often to stay, um, you know, constantly take advantage of the latest and greatest capabilities from us, which has you know, been a challenge in the past because anytime you break compatibility, that becomes a exercise in having to migrate and upgrade becomes a bit of a challenge. So this make it minor uh, that we talked about is is effectively how do you make it easier to read data that's that's created in older versions? That's you know what Shai talked about is is to me fundamentally going to be very very interesting and important to our users. And then a few additional things that you will not show up in 8.0, but they're going to be on that 8.x platform. We've talked about this, the work that the team is doing when it comes to time series data, how we handle store and access time series data. There's a lot of work that's going on to make that more efficient. I personally get really excited about it because you know, Elasticsearch is such a wonderful store, data store for all kinds of data. And if we can optimize it appropriately for different data types, make it efficient, you know, the benefit to, to users is tremendous because you now you're being more efficient in how you store that data, access it and so on. Um, and there's, there's a lot more that's going on, you know, sort of fundamental things that the team uh, is working on. I personally see, and I know Shai is working on some very interesting things around, we started on this journey with searchable snapshots um, and the data tiers on how we decouple compute and storage. And I think that's just the beginning of the journey. I think there's there's more interesting things that will come. And I personally see the 8.x platform as, uh, as the one where uh, there's going to be lots of amazing innovations from the team. So uh, it's just uh, it's a, it's a wonderful inflection point. I love the idea of, of cross-cluster search. Obviously, I created it. We spoke before about Tribe Node historically. I think the... Uh, the effect of this feature ended up being realized more and more as time passed. For example, people care a lot about data sovereignty, right? It's like you want to make sure that data exists within the areas of, you know, the responsibilities that you have and things on those lines. But then you still want to have put data at the hands of people and make them successful because companies, if you hide data, then they won't be successful. Uh, so just the ability to keep data located in, you know, the same places and still being able to go and search it and that's a really exciting feature. Um, now, obviously, now it has the cross-cluster search. It has a new name for a good reason because Tribe Node was much more small, and now it's uh, it's it's a, it's a big one. But I, I love that feature. I think it's uh, 
it's almost like a meta feature that takes search to a whole new level. And that, I, I think that that's very exciting. Uh, to me, it's not a feature that exists today, but it's, uh, uh, it's what we just talked about, make it minor. I think that's, I personally am most excited about what that's going to do for our users. It's going to make it so much easier for users to stop worrying about how they upgrade, when they upgrade. And I can't, I can't wait for that to be, you know, something that's is, is just a natural part of how we look at the product and, and how people keep upgrading. So I'm, I'm most excited about that. Hello, everybody. It's great to see you at Elasticon. My name is Mandy Andrus, and I am the CISO at Elastic. I've been here about four years and have really enjoyed building out the security program and seeing all the powerful things that the Elastic Stack can do for a security team in a great technical organization. What I want to talk to you about today is secure by default and the journey of security in Elastic's products. So we've all heard and seen the stories about companies disclosing data through Elasticsearch instances. And the Shodan search continues to show many open indices on the internet. We want to continue to help our users by making security easier and more seamless. We've continued to improve security over time. And in the beginning, we wanted to make sure that we were first keeping it as simple as possible to get people started with our products. Production users and security issues aren't the immediate concern. Getting things working, understanding how to use the technology are the initial focus. And additionally, more complex security features had not yet been implemented or developed into the stack. And these trade-offs change over time, and so did Elastic with its continued success. So the first change in Elasticsearch 2.0 was to stop binding all interfaces and only bind to localhost. This was a huge change and really started the journey to ensure that Elastic was more secure by default. This was always hilarious in trainings. When a class of 20 would start an Elasticsearch node on their laptops, and it would form a single cluster. Someone would write data into their cluster and someone else would unknowingly delete it. This was happening on 1.0 with binding to all of the hosts and not just local hosts. Less fun if you had a local instance running and you VPNed into your production environment. If you kept the default cluster name on both, you were also making the same connection, which posed some serious problems for a few folks. Security continued to develop, and the core security features became free in version 6.8 and 7.1. This means encrypted network traffic, file and native realm for creating and managing users, role-based access control for user access to cluster APIs and indices were all now free for all users within the Elastic Stack. This was a huge step forward, again, in helping to ensure Elastic Stack and the users were able to be secure by default. The introduction of ECK and the broader Kubernetes environment and tooling made things easier. Tooling can help at times. And ECK has security enabled by default, generates a password for you, plus self-signed certificates. But on the other side, security tooling can sometimes hurt. For example, if you had a server with a public IP, you're using Ubuntu and using UFW, suddenly your Elasticsearch instance is exposed to the internet with a simple Docker command. You need to explicitly bind to localhost in this instance to ensure that it's not automatically connected to the internet or accidentally connected to the internet. Now, Elastic Stack 8.0, secure by default. This will allow the creation of certificates and TLS configurations automatically, passwords generated for the Elastic user, and an enrollment token generated for Kibana. You'll start Kibana, enter the enrollment token, and this token automatically applies the security settings for your Elasticsearch cluster, authenticates to Elasticsearch with the built-in Kibana service account, and writes the security configuration to the Kibana YAML file. While security was available for free, far too few have enabled it. With 8.0, out-of-the-box tooling support improved a lot and allowed us to turn on security by default. Finally, here's how it looks in practice now. Let's get the brand new 8.0 release up and running with security in approximately three minutes. First, let's start an Elasticsearch node. This is one of three and one Kibana instance. 
So while Docker does its thing and well, slowly but steadily starts up, let's take a look at what we have in the settings here on top. Docker run with one gig of heap binding to the default port and running the current Elasticsearch image. We are waiting for this relevant screen here because these are the security details that have been generated by default for us now to set up a secure cluster. And before copying the Elastic user, let's start by copying this one down here, which lets other nodes join. So I have prepared here the window for a second node. I'm pasting that token. Otherwise, it's the same command to start up that node. And to make this a little quicker, we can do the third node right away as well. Now, while these two other nodes start up, let's go back and copy the Elastic user's password that was generated and see if that node is working. Paste the password. This is working fine. So the next step is to see under cat nodes, which nodes have already started up using the same password as before. You can see that right now still only a single node is up, but in a moment or two, this should change. Let's try to run this again. You can see our second node. Let's also start Kibana. With the default parameters, I am configuring my domain where I am accessing this, but this is not strictly required. So let's start Kibana. And at the same time, let's see if my third Elasticsearch node has come up. Yes, all three Elasticsearch nodes are up. Kibana is now also coming up, but here Kibana is actually stopping in this pre-boot stage and saying we need to configure it and basically connect Elasticsearch and Kibana correctly together. For that, we will need this Kibana token here. Let's copy that right away and switch to our browser. Here, I'm opening my brand new Kibana instance, paste my token. Now it wants a verification code to basically verify the other way around. This one is in the output of Kibana. I can copy paste this as well. And now Kibana is properly booting. We can also watch the logs now scroll by after this pre-boot state. And in a moment or two, Kibana will be ready and accessible for us. Now again, we will need the Elastic user and the password of Elastic that we have copied before, which was this one. Pasting this and we are successfully logged in. Now, for good measure, we can run the same no commands that we have run before. Here, for example, I can run cat nodes, and you can see these are the three nodes of my Elasticsearch cluster that are running. All secured, so the communication within the Elasticsearch cluster is secured with TLS with a self generated certificate. The communication to Elasticsearch on HTTP port is secured as well. That's why in these commands, I added the insecure parameter because it is a self-generated certificate. And then Kibana is communicating with that. Thank you, Philip. And this is how the Elastic Stack will be more secure than ever before. One step at a time and another jump with 8.0. Doing this in a distributed system with network encryption is far from trivial, and it's great to finally get into this position. Hi, everyone. My name is Nikola Ruflin. I'm the tech lead at the data collection team. Um, and today I'm going to talk about the future of Ingest. The talk itself, I've split up in two parts. First, we're going to talk about time series, uh, ingesting time series into Elasticsearch. And after that, my favorite topic, we're going to talk about Elastication and Fleet and the future of Ingest. Let's get into it. So, Interesting time series into Elasticsearch. To understand where we're heading, we need to understand the past. So here on the right side, we have Elasticsearch. And when we ingest the data in the past, and actually up to, to now is, let's say we ingest the data from FileBeat. We got a FileBeat-star index. Basically, all the data from FileBeat went in the same index. 
Same is true for metric beat. Same is true for log stash. And of course, same is true for your own chipper or fluency, anything else. We kind of have introduced a naming scheme that if you have a product, you're likely going to use that prefix. So whatever data you collect with FileBeat, it's ending up in the same index. But that has some consequences. So let's think of the Nginx data. So let's say we have multiple products or different use cases collecting Nginx data. So on the one hand, we're going to say, OK, that's logging. So it's going to end up in FileBeat. But wait, the Fluentd collects it. It's going to end up in the Fluentd index. Oh, there is also metrics. What if it's a different tool that collects it? And actually, Nginx might also ship some APM data. And along comes security analytics now saying, wait a minute, access logs for Nginx? This is also security data. So are they now going to crawl the file beat and the fluent D index? How is everyone going to deal with all this data now that it actually depends on the shipper and not necessarily the data itself? So we took a step back and we came up with kind of a very simple logic is Nginx data no matter who collected it, it should always look the same. It should not matter how you collected it. So to solve that problem, we basically came up with two things. The first one is the Elastic Common Schema. Some of you might have heard of the Elastic Common Schema. It, it defines some fields like host name, host IP, information that is common across many events, and defines a schema for it so that everyone can use it and all data looks a bit similar. So if you want to filter all data on a host IP, you can. If it's access logs from Nginx or Apache, doesn't matter. It is actually good with meta information in ECS. Part that is missing today, but hopefully gets fixed soon, is metric data types. So Elasticsearch right now is actually working on improving and introducing metric data types into Elasticsearch. So that's also going to make it an Elastic Common Schema. And the second part we worked on is the data stream naming scheme. And I'll show you, you that in a bit. So what that is, is basically it defines that all logs, no matter where they come from, go into the same data streams. And data stream is kind of the new thing of indices for uh, time series. And if you remember something from that presentation, I really want you to remember that combination of ECS and the data stream naming scheme. It's really important for the future of ingesting data in the Elastic Stack. So let's look at an example. On the left side, we have the Eng and Nginx success log. And on the right side, we have Elasticsearch. And as you see, we have a data stream called logs-nginx.access-star. The star is kind of, there you can put your own need, your team, your company, whatever you need there. But the prefix is always the same. So it's logs and it's Nginx success data set. Attached to it is the mappings and the interest pipeline. And the interest pipeline is the important part here. Is historically, you set actually the interest pipeline on interest time. So you always had to set it when you send it somewhere, for example, in FileBeat. But that changed now because it's attached there it becomes re not irrelevant from where you ship it in. And there's an interesting addition to here on the bottom, the runtime fields. So historically, you normally had to set the structure of your data in advance. But with runtime fields in Elasticsearch, you can actually ingest the raw Nginx success logs and on the fly query data and process the data because you might not know in advance the way it's going to look like. So let's look at a few examples. Of course, Data could come from Elastic Agent, from FileBeat. It's going to end up in Elasticsearch. Let's say you use Kafka in between. It actually doesn't matter. Your data goes through Kafka, picked up by Logstash, and in the end, it's sent to the same data stream. You want to use Elastic Agent to pick up the data or send the data Elastic Agent to Logstash directly? Still, the processing, the mapping, the runtime fields still look the same. You can use Logstash directly. You can even use Fluentd. As long as you send the data to that data stream, the processing is going to happen because the log file on the left side didn't change. You just read it in line by line. It's going to work. You could go even further. You say, I define my own shipper. I, I wrap something around tail F 
um, at an Elasticsearch client, it's just going to work. So as you see on that screen, it's kind of the inches path becomes rather less relevant. It's really about where the data ends up, the structure. Uh, so that ensures that whoever consumes the data, security, monitoring, observability, it doesn't matter. It's always the same place. And the new data stream naming scheme has a few other technical benefits, better compression, uh, faster queries with it. There's a whole topic around it, and but I can't dive into it today, unfortunately. So let's talk about Elastic Agent and Fleet as the future of Ingest for Elastic. So the good news, Elastic Agent and Fleet actually enforce the data stream naming scheme on ECS. So if you use it, you already use that data stream naming scheme. So let's look at Elastic Agent today. Elastic Agent today is basically a supervisor. And for the ones that haven't heard of Elastic Agent itself, it is to be run on the edge to collect your logs, metrics, and all the things that Beats does. But instead of having to deploy five Beats, you just run Elastic Agent there. And it's going to install the Beats uh, or going to run the Beats it needs under the hood. There are two modes of Elastic Agent. One is standalone, yeah, like you're used to from Beats. And the other one is actually a managed mode. So managed mode, we have that noted here as fleet, is you go to Kibana, you enroll your Elastic Agent, and then you can do all the configuration through either the UI or through APIs in Kibana. As soon as you actually use it in managed mode, all the credential handling is done for you. There is API keys uh, per each agent, and the whole management happens. You can even trigger upgrades through the UI, and it's going to do it for you on the Edge machine. The data, so we have on the top, we kind of have the whole control plane, and on the bottom, we have the data plane. Right now, in most scenarios, Elasticsearch control and data plane storage is the same. But of course, in the future, it can be separate. So that's kind of what we have today. But also, let's talk about where Elastic Agent is heading. So the main difference you see here on the left side is we kind of split up Elastic Agent a bit. And one of the problems we have today with Elastic Agent is when you ship the data, each bit beat does the shipping on its own. So you have like six, seven, eight connections to Elasticsearch. But that's not ideal uh, to have that many connections open. And the second problem is if you want to develop an, kind of your own collector today, you have to write a full beat. Actually, the community did a lot in the past and still does it, which is amazing to see. And in theory, you could actually run these directly on the Elastic Agent. But we want to go further and make it much easier, actually, that you can develop your own inputs. So you see that on the left side is you develop your inputs and we take care of shipping the data to Elasticsearch as shown here, but it could be Kafka, it could be Lackstash, whatever output the shipper supports. And here we come talking about your own inputs. So on the left side, there, should, there is a future that you should be able to develop your input, maybe in Python, maybe in Ruby, the whole Elastic Agent written Golang, and we run it for you. You're going to collect your data. We make sure it's ending up in Elasticsearch. Data stream naming scheme is followed, and the ECS is followed. And on the right side, you see your integration. So one thing that Fleet has is it allows you uh, to install assets like inches pipeline mappings uh, and so on for the indices. So you can actually build your own integrations and your own inputs, and together you get the full experience for your custom logs. The whole right side, you might run it on-prem, but of course, we have Elastic, H, Elastic Cloud for that. So it all runs in the cloud, and you get it there. And going a step further, of course, there is Prometheus, Hotel, Azure, AWS, all the public popular clouds. You can actually send your data to the cloud, or you see the arrow here is bi-directional. You either push it, it's pushed to the cloud, or it's pulled from the cloud. So all your data ends up there. Uh, standards like Hotel are supported by APM today. And of course, we make sure all these standards are supported by the whole stack so you can ingest your data in Elasticsearch without having to think about all the transformations. So that's it from my end. I hope I was able to give you a quick insight on the future of ingest. Of course, there's a lot still coming. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.
Sure. Yeah. My name is uh, Tony. I'm on the Elastic Security team. I've been here for uh, the last couple of years and I came to Elastic uh, in 2019 by way of uh, in-game. All right. So this is a really good question. And uh, just to maybe take a step back and set some context, I like to think about this absurd number, $10.5 trillion. That's uh, what's estimated over the next couple of years. That that's how much money the world, not you and me, but the world together is going to spend on the costs from cybercrime, from, from damage and loss. And like you contrast that massive, unfathomable number with a trillion dollars, I think is how much money um, the world invested in security products. Like something's broken. You're, we're spending increasingly more money on uh, this problem and it's getting worse, like way worse. Like I can't even think about what, what $10.5 trillion is. So I, I think as I think about what uh, gets me excited about uh, Elastic Security in the next year or two, um, I think a, a really important theme is how we are uh, intentionally investing in a free and open security product that anyone can use on our cloud today. Like right now, you can use it right now. That That really, I don't know, it gives me goosebumps to, to think about that because I, I think we the way we make a difference is by making our product freely available for anyone to use today, right now, uh, to do it in the open, uh, to make it better through through collaboration and engaging with our community people like you. Um, I think that is the step that we have to take in order to fix this problem where we're investing increasingly more money on this problem and, and yet we continue to uh, spend all of this money on on the damage and loss. $10.5 trillion blows my mind. Uh, I don't have that on me. I don't think you do either. Um, so we have to do something. So uh, I guess there's probably uh, a couple things that I would love to highlight. There's many things to pick from, but I think one thing that gets me really excited is what we can do at the intersection of observability and security. So, so my background is security. And this is something that over the last couple of years, has, has sort of kind of become obvious for me. Um, let's say if you're, uh, you're looking at production and you have some performance issues, you know, if you're an observability user, um, you know, you might be thinking about, okay, well, when did this problem start? How can I isolate it to the specific service or server that's having a problem? Um, you know, in our, our Elastic Observability solution that, again, is freely available for anyone to use in the cloud today, um, that's that solution can help you um, figure out when that problem started, where it is, is it CPU and memory? And then you can really dive deep into, well, what's causing this issue? You know, what are the stack traces that might highlight a bug in someone's code? Um, you can take a look at the logs. You can get a much better, more comprehensive picture into that problem. And as I, I think about that as a security user, like those are the same questions that I would want to be asking myself if I were hunting for some threat in my network. Um, in fact, a lot of incident response teams, when they come to a new engagement, you know, a large uh, enterprise, one of the first things they'll probably start to do is look at some of the servers or hosts that are having performance issues or their crash jumps on that box. Um, and I think this is something that the, the log4j bug um, from December of last year really illustrates well. Uh, the features that uh, observability users have at their disposal are the same you know, problems I have to solve as a threat researcher or a security analyst. Um, I, I want to understand the same level of detail and get the same level of visibility and insight um, that, uh, you know, observability users um, have for, for their use cases. And so I, I think there's just this incredible opportunity at the intersection of observability and security where people have, we recognize people have the same problems. Uh, and so when you're, when you're looking for these issues and trying to understand the problems, um, I think there's a lot of power uh, by by assuming and, and understanding that these two problems are actually very similar to one another. What else uh, am I excited to share with the community? So I, I think another thing that um, I'm really excited to, to um, work with our community on this next year or two is uh, some of the investments that we're making in eBPF. Um, this is something that uh, you know the Linux kernel community has been looking at for a long time. And uh, over the last year, we've partnered with uh, some amazing people that know what they're doing in eBPF. Uh, you know, we have some people that literally wrote the book on using eBPF uh, for Linux observability, now working with us at Elastic. Um, we've partnered with companies like CMD and Optimize 
again, that understand that if you want to gain uh, insights into cloud workloads, uh, really understand some of the nuances there and do it in a way that's performant, um, you know, eBPF is increasingly becoming the way that um, you should approach doing that. So I'm really excited about some of the things that we're going to be able to do in the product with this capability and this technology. Um, you'll even see on our blog today, we just released uh, the very first um, open source tool that can show you your code coverage in BPF to actually understand the execution of your programs that you're writing uh, in the Linux kernel. Uh, this is something that uh, is really useful to, uh, to us, and I, I think it's awesome that we can give that back to the community. So if you were to ask me, again, what are some of the things that are um, really uh, I'm looking forward to? Um, I think there's some amazing things that we can do at the intersection of observability and security. Um, and I'm really excited about uh, the, just the awesome people that we have on our team that can um, try to understand what we can do with eBPF uh, and, and, again, to deliver that to our users to do some amazing things.